So I think, I think it's the first time I've managed to send someone to sleep even before starting the talk. It usually, usually takes me at least a little while, I must be perfecting my craft. The real art of the Dhamma speaker though is when they manage to send themselves to sleep. <laughs> That's when you really know that you've made it. Somebody joked about that when we were at Wat Manachat once. They said, oh, and in Yantra, known to give such long talks, they've fallen asleep on the Dhamma chair. And uh, someone, Adam Jaisara was there. He said, yeah, I know how he feels. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the um, third in our installment of talks on uh, meta meditation in which I'm trying to go fairly thoroughly over the uh, course of meta meditation as uh, taught by Ajahn Mahachachai and uh, during the uh, first week, first talk we did on this, we, we covered what Ajahn Mahachachai calls the Jipen Klan, the mind in the middle. And so this is like the, the uh, practice similar to other practices known as like bare awareness or just sitting or uh, mindful awareness or something like that where one just sits and spends a bit of time to settle into the to the sitting, into the practice and kind of get to know yourself, get to know your feelings, your uh, the, the way your body is, the way your thoughts are and uh, sort of it's a way of kind of just settling back into the armchair and, and just sort of relaxing to be with yourself and to be comfortable with that. And then we talked about the second week we talked about the uh, starting of loving-kindness meditation and how to actually go about the loving-kindness meditation itself. And I went through a number of steps in that and I might just repeat some of those steps briefly before going on and uh, then hopefully talking about the next stage. So if I repeat myself in these talks then it's either because it's a useful teaching device or it's because I forgot what I said last week. You can take your pick. Uh, first thing we do when we when we start our meta meditation, we focus well from doing the, the Jip and Glang, the initial practice, we learn one of the things we learn from that is how it feels to focus our awareness in the body and how it, what it feels like to linger and spend time just within the body and noticing the, the sensations that you're feeling there. And so it then becomes a natural progression, just leaving your body there and with the feelings in there to, to start to just leave your attention there inside your body, usually around the heart, and just start saying, may I be happy, may I be happy. Each, each of these steps like unfolds into the ne- next. You don't, you're not sort of doing something massively different from one stage to the next but just sort of just sort of prodding it along a little bit and so I emphasize the different steps in the, in the initial phase of doing love and kindness for yourself first thing was to repeat the words clearly and enunciate them clearly so that you actually uh, focus on actually just saying the words well to yourself and the second step was to uh, reflect or or turn the attention of the mind or, or allow into the mind the, the dimension of, of, of the meaning of the words, what you're actually wishing for. Because this great wish for one's own spiritual happiness, which is what metta is all about. And uh, the third stage uh, is to look for the feeling of metta. Okay, so this is like all within the first stage of metta, but these are the, this is the process towards developing the feeling of metta. And so I talked a bit about what this feeling is like and looking for this small, subtle uh, feeling that will arise and trying to just keep, keep a watch of that, like you'd keep watch of a little bird. And also talked a bit about how the feeling might not be small and subtle at all. It might be a big and overwhelming Massive feeling, maybe it'll be overwhelming powers of like waterfalls of, of rapture and uh, all of these kinds of things. So to just keep on going through those things and they're, they're neither uh, here nor there. They're, they're nice things to happen but they shouldn't distract you from your the main object of your practice. And remember this, always remember this when you're doing meditation is that the meditation teacher is teaching you what you need to do to practice and what's actually going to get you where you want. 
So don't be distracted by anything else. Just keep on remembering what you're actually supposed to be doing and keep coming back to that. And if you stray away from that too much or too often, then you're just going to lose the point and you'll never find out what the result of that practice is going to be. So hopefully we can all be practicing these last few weeks and we've all got some kind of taste of what this feeling of metta is. And initially the feeling is localized in a certain part of the body. And so what I want to talk about this week is how to spread and develop that localized initial feeling of metta into the uh, more fully developed, what we call the preliminary sign or preliminary nimitta of metta. So when, when you're focusing attention on the feeling, the feeling arises, you have mind, the focus of the mind inside the body and together with the words of loving kindness, may I be happy, may I be happy, and then the feeling comes up there, it arises at some place in the body. Using that skill that you've learnt through doing the, the uh, mindful awareness practice, you learn to focus and watch that feeling in the body with a degree of uh, attachment. Oh, sorry, of detachment, not attachment. With a degree of, there still will be a degree of attachment, I'm sure. But so we certainly attachment, but at least a degree of detachment, so that you're able to watch it. Even it's pleasant feeling, but you're watching the pleasant feeling with a bit of equanimity. And this is the difference between this and the overwhelming experiences of rapture that can happen with with metta meditation. And uh, when the, when the rapture is very overpowering and overwhelming. What's lacking is that slight sense of emotional uh, equanimity and, and uh, um, a slight sense of like watching over rather than being involved in it too much. And so this is what causes that, that sort of excessive emotional reaction which, which, which manifests as uh, strong feelings of rapture which are, are fun but don't lead the mind to peace. So... Focusing on that feeling and holding that together with the words of metta and trying to maintain that for as long as you can. Now if you just watch that feeling and it stays there for a few seconds or a few minutes and then disappears, then you've just got to keep on going back to that and keep on trying to, to, to bring it back to mind, to connect with it again. Once you've seen it, each time you see it, it makes it easier to get back there. Okay, so you learn to tune your mind in to the feeling and so to arouse it there. So don't be doubting, don't be thinking, oh, is this the real feeling or is it not? It doesn't matter whether it's real or not. Okay, it only matters whether it's a suitable resting place for the mind, a suitable place. Is it happy? Is it, is it soft? Is it gentle? Does it have those qualities? Those, those qualities are all that we're looking for. Don't worry about real or not real. This is something we get caught up with entirely unnecessarily. And so as we're watching that, the more we focus on it, then it starts to feed back. So the more we focus, it focus improves, the steadiness of our mind improves and the strength of the feeling also improves. It becomes clearer, more pure. Uh, the feeling becomes stronger. Be careful about how, I, when, I, when I use the word stronger like that, there's, there's really two different kinds of strength that come in, in, in meditation and uh, it can be used, the word strong can be used in two ways. Uh, one, one kind of strength is what I was referring to earlier, talking about the strong feelings of rapture. It's something which is very, very obvious and very in your face and this kind of strong is quite a crude, almost a physical, physical energetic strongness which is quite coarse. And then there's another kind of strength which is a very quiet uh, strength and which is a strength that comes, it has a quality of immovability to it, a quality of, of, of not having to assert itself, a quality of being confident within itself. And so this kind of strength is the kind of strength that comes up when the nimitta is being developed properly, that, that, that there's a sense of having the confidence within itself to, to it's not a strength that, that shows off, but it's a strength that you notice because it's not intimidated and, and shunted off stage by other feelings and other thoughts and so on. 
Okay, and so when you're really paying attention in this way, the feeling of metta becomes more constant, and you're you're watching it in a way that's that's that being held, and yes, other thoughts are coming into the mind and going out of the mind. Other emotions are coming into the mind and out of the mind. These things are happening as as they ordinarily do. The mind's moving around to different places, but there's a sense of momentum to it, so that even if you get distracted for a few minutes, maybe for you know for not just for a second or two, but even for a few minutes, you can be distracted, and. Uh, when you realize you're distracted, mindfulness comes back, you go back to the feeling, you realize it's actually still there. Okay, So it has this sense of inner, inner momentum. It builds up this energy. And this is what I mean by strength, in this, in this sense, in this good sense. And so when you feel that, you can pay attention to this feeling for you know, a good few minutes, and the feeling is not fluctuating too much, and feels like it's gradually getting stronger and more constant, then the next thing you want to try to do is to spread it around the body. Okay, So this is the next thing. So this is like within the first stage of, of loving kindness meditation, I guess there's like four sub-stages. Right? The first one to say the words carefully, the second one to reflect on the meaning of the words, the third one to bring up the feeling of metta, and the fourth one we're at now is to spread that feeling through the body. And so we're now, what, to, to do this, it's a very simple and quite a lovely trick, and uh, you simply there's really there's really two ways that you can do it. One way is a bit more deliberate, and and you you move the mind around the body as if you were spreading butter on a piece of bread, and you move your mind around the body just to different parts, and as as your mind goes around, the feeling of metta goes with them, with with the mind, with the sense of awareness. And you're like painting on, you're just moving it around because the feeling is of course in your mind, not in your body. And wherever your mind goes, that feeling goes as well. Now, when we say moving the mind around the body, then of course this has an only a, an indirect relationship to the physical body. It's really the uh, perceived body, the body as, as we see it from inside. This is where you're moving the mind around this perceived body, uh, which you can call, if you like, the mind-made body, or the subtle body, something like that. It's the body as we are conscious of it from the inside. And it might not correspond to the physical body. Usually it corresponds reasonably well to the physical body. This is how we avoid walking into walls and things like that, because we have an inner picture of where our body is. Uh, but... In some cases it might not. For example, if you have an amputated limb and people have like a phantom image of where their their feet might be, even though maybe their, their foot's been chopped off. So this is this inner body. And this is where you're moving the mind around and spreading metta to everywhere in this body. Now, one of the things that you're doing here is a number, a number of things you're doing. One is that you're playing with your meditation so you're developing like a skill in your meditation by, by, t by training it to do something a bit different. Okay? So this is one of the things you're doing. So you treat it like a game, like something you can um, perfect. It's like a skill that you can develop. So this is one thing that you're doing. Another thing that you're doing is you are, in a sense, replacing or uh, like leeching out the, the normal physical feelings which we are being which we're being which is being fed into the mind okay so normally as we're all sitting here we have this this mind made projection or, or recognition this memory of what our body is like and this we carry with us all the time and that mind made projection is constantly being updated by information which is fed to us from all the senses, but largely, and most importantly, from the actual physical, the nerves within the physical body itself. And so this is constantly being updated. And so what you're doing is you're, you're, you're tending to replace those signals that are being sent from the physical body, and now there's now relatively less signals being sent from the physical body and more signals being sent from the mental, mental side, if you like. And so you're, you're gradually replacing the physical body with a mental perception of the body. 
Now, those of you who've done some breath meditation and have have, have uh, taken that past the first few stages will recognize that this is a very similar process, in fact, an identical process that happens when you're doing breath meditation. When you start out doing breath meditation, you start out watching the physical breath, and that's all there is, is a physical breath. Later on, as the meditation deepens, you start to see the brightness in the breath, you start to see the, the bliss in the breath, and what you're actually starting to notice is like the mental counterpart of the breath, it's the mental image of the breath which we carry around in our mind, which you're starting to become aware of. It's still the breath, because the breath as it is now is made up of that mental image, together with feedback from the body. But just that feedback from the body is is lessening, becoming less important. And so now the same process, exactly the same process, is happening with the metta meditation. You're sending the metta all through the different parts of the body, so that the feelings signals which your body is sending out become dampened and the meta signals become stronger. So one of the things that that does, that does a number of things. One thing it does, it makes your sitting more comfortable. You can be more, have a more of a sense of ease with your sitting. It can also help to improve your body. It can have a lot of side effects in terms of good health and things like that. It can certainly help to tranquilize and bring a sense of ease to your body. Often, or normally as you're doing this, the, 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 the parts of the body that you move the metta to will respond in different ways. And this is because, uh, of course, you know, since our body and our mind are always so intimately linked and always, always feeding back to each other, is that we tend to embody our emotions in different ways. And so different parts of the body for one reason or another, become associated with different kinds of emotions and we we tend to lock different kinds of emotions up in different parts of the body. And so when you take the feeling of metta through those parts, you'll tend to get a different response from from various parts of the body. Okay, So don't worry too much about this. This is just something to notice as you go on. There's no big deal, there's nothing exciting about it really or or extraordinary it's just very normal so just don't worry too much you can notice these things as you go past if there are parts of the body where it's very difficult for you to put the feeling of metta okay because they're very painful or they feel very stuck or something then just leave those parts aside just sort of flow around them and leave them behind leave those little islands and then keep on doing the easy bits first and so do as much of your body as you can, moving the mind round, just leaving those few little islands to be, to just, you know, be, they can just stay as they are for the time being. Often what you find is that if you do that, by the time you've done most of the body and you come back to look at the whole body again, those islands tend to disappear by themselves often. If they don't disappear by themselves and if you can do most of the body but there's a few bits that are really annoying you and really kind of uh, stopping you then just try to take the feeling and just wash that that feeling very gently through those parts okay so just taking the feeling and just gently repeatedly just massaging it or or soothing it so not not trying to to beat it the beat that pain or that tightness out but just just like sprinkling very gently sprinkling metta onto that that part just with a soft rhythm of moving the mind through. And uh, just keep on doing that, massaging it, until it eases. You don't have to make it... Don't, don't, don't try to make it go away. If you try to make it go away, that's another kind of aversion. But you just, just to ease it off. And so there's a sense of acceptance. The feelings will go away by themselves. You don't have to get too concerned with them. So this is something you know, to remember in your meditation. Don't get too hung up over the different kinds of feelings and things and sensations in your body you know these are not they're just they're just kind of normal feelings don't don't um don't get too involved with them so as you keep on doing that moving the the metta around there's a sense of bliss and a sense of light there and then this goes around all the way around the whole body and so on and then you become feeling a very relaxed and everything and so this is like one 
I mentioned a few minutes ago, there are like two ways of spreading the metta. This is one way, is like moving it around quite deliberately, and that's a good way, especially for starters. Uh, as you get, you know, maybe your metta is stronger, or maybe you're deeper in retreat, and it becomes more natural. Uh, and then uh, there's no need to move the metta around physically one place to the other like that, but just to let it grow in your heart. And then as it grows in the heart, it will just naturally spread out and fill up the whole body. Okay, So that's a much simpler way to do. And that way is fine if, if the metta feels like it's flowing and it, and it doesn't need so much work. If it's just flowing, then just let it overflow and let it fill up the whole body. And the end result is the same, that you'll feel the feeling of metta right from the top of the head down to the soles of the feet. And, you know, just experiment. Again, play around a little bit. Move the mind around the body and test out. Can I feel metta in all of these places? Is there still feeling of loving kindness there? When you feel that that's reasonably complete right throughout the whole body, then you return your awareness, bring it back to a whole body awareness. Okay? So now, rather than going from one bit to another, moving the mind around one bit to another, you're you're focusing on the whole body. So you allow your awareness to become quite broad. The mind is like sunk into and immersed into this perception of the whole body and keeping it still like that. So if you can uh, do that, then it will be very pleasant. It's a very nice feeling. Your body very relaxed and very pleasant, very blissful. Thoughts, yes, thoughts will still be coming and going, but not so important, not so much something to worry about. And the body will be generally quite comfortable. Uh, You, you know, you'll, you know, drift off into thoughts and lose mindfulness for a while, and then you'll come back, and the feeling will still more or less be there. You know, it'll go down a little bit in its energy, but it'll come back again quite quickly. And, uh, you, you know, you almost feel like you can get a perception of yourself and, you know, it'll be a little bit like if you've ever seen a, a picture of a crystal Buddha image uh, which is lit from behind with a candle and, uh, you know, you can see that the whole shape just glowing with light like that. And so at this stage you can, you can always get this feeling like the whole body glowing with light, gently, not anything really overpowering. This is like a gentle glow of light with a um, feeling of bliss and happiness through. And so it keeps on with the words, may I be happy, may I be happy, may I be happy. Whenever distracting thoughts come into the mind, as usual, if as a general principle in meditation, if uh, distracting thoughts come into, a mi- into your mind and um, then you can use like a three fold strategy okay to deal with them first strategy is just ignore them and keep on going so if there's just a little bit of thought a little bit of distraction just ignore it and keep on going on with your meditation so that's the first one second one if uh, the thoughts repeated and taking your mind quite a long way off your meditation then you can just note them thinking 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 just like we did in the beginning of the practice just note them thinking 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 realize them okay and then come back. If that doesn't work and the thoughts are really obsessing you and taking you off your meditation and then you need to do something actively to try to, to, to stop those thoughts. And so this is where the five methods that were taught in the Vitaka Santana Sutta that we, taught, we learned the other day, this is where they come in, where you can actually like, reflect on the nature of the thoughts, reflect on the dangerous nature of the thoughts and so on and so forth. To really, to really try to, to remind yourself very strongly that, of how important it is to come back to your meditation and then return to the practice after that. So this just generally as a threefold strategy. And so as you're keeping on going this metta, holding that feeling in your body and loving kindness for yourself, and if you can maintain that for, say, 10 to 20 minutes, uh, in that way, and then this is what, according to Ajahn Mahachachai's system, this would be called uh, um, kanika samadhi, or momentary concentration. Uh, and the the state 
of the the actual state of metta at that time would be called the um, ugaha nimitta, the the preliminary or learning sign of metta. Okay, so just to briefly explain these technical terms, uh, in Theravadan meditation theory, as developed in the Visuddhimagga. Uh, it generally divides the levels of concentration into three kinds, kanika samadhi, upachara samadhi and apana samadhi. Now, uh, apana samadhi is straightforward enough, it's equivalent to jhana. Kanika and upachara samadhi are somewhat more difficult to define. The way that Ajahn Mahachacha uses them is, I think, how they are actually used in the Visuddhimagga itself. So as I think similar uh, kinds of stages of concentration as is discussed in the Visuddhimagga. Uh, I'm not sure whether the commentaries themselves use these terms consistently uh, and certainly uh, modern teachers of meditation do not use these terms consistently. So for example, kanika samadhi, the word kana means moment, obviously referring to a short period of time and that's usually interpreted in in two ways. One way is like the way that we've uh, talked about it now is of maintaining awareness on the meditation object with 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 a preliminary nimitta for a short period of time, say 10 to 20 minutes. The other way it's interpreted these days is uh, moment-to-moment concentration, so one one's concentration on each object is momentary, and of course this is the way that's emphasised in the Mahasi tradition is how they interpret kanika samadhi. The other term upachara samadhi is means neighbourhood or uh, access or threshold concentration, and uh, upachara is defined in the Visuddhimagga as being a state where the five hindrances have ended uh, and yet one has not fully entered into jhana. And so it's understood as... The the best way to understand it is just simply, literally what it means. We're walking down the road, we're coming coming to the house. The house is the the house with uh, four rooms in it. It's of course the four jhanas and we're walking down the road towards that. And when we come to the house, it's raining and raining onto us with all the, the pain and suffering of dukkha in, in the sensual realm. And then when we arrive at the house, we step out of the rain onto the front porch and we get a kind of an ease from the rain. We're out of the rain or we're out of the sun or we're out of the wind. And yet, it's very easy for the wind to shift a little bit and it can blow on us once more. We're, we're kind of out of it, but we're not really out of it. It's so easy for the wind to shift or for the rain to splash up on us or something like that. And so the front porch is kind of out of the elements but not really in a place of security and safety yet. And so the front word for front porch in Pali is upachara. And so that's exactly what the upachara samadhi is. Just on the front porch in front of jhana and where you're not quite there yet, but almost there. So... Uh, in again in, in classical Theravadan meditation theory the Kanika Samadhi is signified by what we call the Ugaha Nimitta so the, 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 when we talk about the Samadhi and the Nimitta in this sense it, they're really just two aspects of the same thing if you like they're the uh, subjective and objective aspect of the same experience when we talk about the subjective aspect of it, we talk about the, the samadhi, the kanika samadhi. It's the nature of the mental factors that are present at that time, mental qualities. And when we talk about what the mind is aware of, the object of meditation, then we use the word nimitta. This is like the object of meditation. And so these are really just two aspects of the same thing. So the uggaha nimitta, is described in the Suddhimagga as things like a, a, a veil of mist is one, perhaps one of the best ways of doing it. Like a, it's like a, like, a, like a vague glow, like a lightness or brightness that appears in the mind, like maybe the, the moon that's obscured by dim cloud, by, by light clouds. Or you know, something like that is probably the best, best simile for it. And so you, usually there'll be a feeling of brightness there 
Um, but the, in metta meditation, the, the more prominent aspect of the nimitta is the feeling of it. And so be a feeling of, of, of um, bliss and happiness which has a certain steadiness uh, to it and a certain definition to it, okay, that we call the Ugaha Nimitta. And then the, the Pati Bhaga Nimitta, which arises at the time of Upachara Samadhi, and this is des- described as being like, like the full moon when it comes out from behind the clouds. Or it's big, you know, it's like the, the the brilliant sun in the middle of the daytime, or something like this. So it's much, much more powerful experience than the, the initial ugaha nimitta. So we're at this stage when we're still talking, you know, having I mean, this is just to to give an idea of the the stages of meditation in the technical language. Again, don't get hung up on this stuff. We're just just using the language just to give you an idea of where we should be going in our practice. And so when this, this Ugaha Nimitta arises, there's a, there's a subtle and sometimes not all that clear, but usually a noticeable kind of ah oh moment when ah, oh, you just, you settle into it. And then you can feel ah, oh, there's, there is like this moment where it's almost like you, and there you are. And it's, you know, it's not something you can do, but it's just something where there's a bit of a letting go and a bit of a relaxing about the meditation, and there you are. And you learn to recognize this. So it's, it, it is something which you can feel, even though it's a grad, very much a gradual progression, but there is something meaningful about these stages. They do actually correspond to reality. There is a sort of a stage where you, you feel like that's starting to, to set in place. And so we keep this awareness of the whole body maintaining this awareness of the whole body and try to keep that going for about 10 to 20 minutes at least. Okay. Now if while you're doing it over the 10 to 20 minutes you feel that it doesn't last that time or if it you know, goes away or uh, whatever then you just need to keep on coming back doing it again and again and again and building up the strength. If you feel while you're doing that for the 20 minute period that uh, it stays strong or even increases in strength, if you feel like it stays firm and your mind has energy and uh, you want to to continue on and then you can proceed to the next stage of metta, loving kindness, which is the metta for the loved person. Okay, So I won't talk about that, I'll leave that for this week and uh, I think that's enough um, information for now. And uh, we should maybe go and do some guided meditation. But before we go do any guided meditation, I may just ask if there's any um, comments or questions about what we've uh, talked about so far this evening. Um, I used to concentrate on two minutes and we open the whole body or just each body part at this that, yeah, that rough period of 20 minutes is like after you after you get to the feeling of the whole body awareness. Okay, so it might take it'll take you a while to get there. Typically, I mean, if your meditation goes well, you know, it might take you say 20 minutes to get to that stage where you can feel the metta through your whole body, and then to sit with that whole body awareness for another 20 minutes or something like that. It of course very very rough guideline but just give you some some idea of what to expect. Okay, so let's uh, do some kind of meditation.
sitting comfortably. Whenever thoughts come into the mind, you just note them thinking, thinking, thinking. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Watching inside the heart. With equanimity, mindfulness. Leaving the mind inside the heart, bring up the words, may I be happy, may I be happy, may I be happy. Focusing on making the the enunciation of the words clear.
reminding oneself of the meaning of the words. Noticing the feeling arising. Very soft feeling. Joy. Like the radiance of the candle flame.
and you notice that feeling. Gently hold that in the mind. Keeping it safe, keeping it protected. And as the feeling becomes more secure, steady, gently move the mind around to different parts of the body, taking the feeling of metta with it. Soothing and easing every part of the body
until you can perceive a whole body image. Oneself as one sits here, holding in the mind a whole body.
And finally letting the words of metta go, letting the feeling of metta fade away, allowing the mind to return to a neutral space, empty, open and clear. Only with the mind at peace, just take a minute or two to review over what happened in that meditation. How did I just use my mind? What was going on? How did I understand the meditation instructions? How did my mind respond to the meditation? What is my mind like now compared with how it was at the start of the meditation? Finally, we can dedicate the merit of our practice. May all beings be happy, may all beings be well. May all beings rejoice in the merit of our practice. May all beings finally realize Nibbana. So, so, so. Are there any more questions before we finish? Last week, um, Alex talked about doing meta to a the melody. What I've noticed, and I just wondered had any thoughts about it is that sometimes when I can't um, I can't actually access Meta saying it but I'm out somewhere in the forest and I sing it mm. it's like not to a, a tune I know just whatever comes with the words but it's like just an immediate path into joy and, and just sort of doing it that way are you a good singer? No, I'm a terrible singer. I'm <laughs> <laughs> <Totally> private. <laughs> that would be nice if it was a gift that you could share with others. Yeah, yeah sure. Anything, anything, you know, to get the get the feeling going. You know, that doesn't. That's that's um. You know, it doesn't really matter what it is. That uh, as long as it. As long as it gets the juices flowing, that's fine. It's just a problem with all, all of those things. It's not the problem with the, the things themselves, but it's a problem with the the, um, the development is the problem. You know, so the, the 
and, and you know that's what really distinguishes metta meditation from just feelings of metta because of course you have feelings of metta in any situation just in family situations or watching a movie or whatever it is and you have the feelings coming but how do you actually develop those in a very deep way and that's where the that's where you have to be a bit more careful a bit more stringent but yeah basically anything goes as far as getting the feelings going you were going to talk, oh, you mentioned, I can't remember, was it last week or the week before, um, about the problem that Westerners often have about finding themselves the hardest to give love to. Mm-hmm. Is now okay to talk about that? <coughs> oh, um. <coughs> Could I leave that till next week? Is that okay? So, sorry. It's, yeah, it's an ongoing thing. It's 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 um perhaps better to to talk about it in the context of the the second person. Not that one. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.